It's 3.15, and that means it's time for... The Real Deal with Bill McNeil. That's right. Welcome once again to The Real Deal with Bill McNeil. I'm your host, Bill McNeil, and you're probably wondering exactly what is The Real Deal today. Hey, good question. Welcome back to Thinking Critical. This is Wes, and this is one of the things that we've been covering here on the channel for quite a while is... Uh, the, the changing of the readership within comic books as in it's getting older as time goes by and it doesn't feel like they're able to attract enough new readers to replace older readers as they as they move on. Now we talked to Perch about this and some retailers, but I haven't really talked to a comic book creator. So I thought who better than uh, comic book writer, award winning editor Joe Corral to come on the channel and give his perspective just as far as the changing demographics of comic book readers and, and some of the issues about uh, attracting new readers. How you doing, Joe? I'm Ray Wes. How are you? I'm doing well. So this is an interesting uh, conversation to have. Obviously, we've seen uh, as the prices have gone up and it feels like there's more comics out available more now than ever, but the comic book readership itself has been shrinking for quite some time and getting older. As mm -hmm. I, I, I had personal friends that you know during my military days are always talking about comics. They, they moved on to manga and other things because... Uh, they just thought there was better value there. Sure. And the, the comic industry itself has found itself in, in quite a pickle, as in they need to attract new readers, but they also need to keep the readers that they do have, but they yeah. also haven't really marketed to this demographic probably since the 80s, since they kind of abandoned, you know, um, newsprint went kind of all in on the direct market during the boom of the early 90s. And it feels like they haven't had to court young readers ever since. What are your thoughts on that? Had, had they did they completely abandon young readers in the nineties? Uh, you know, it's like yes and no. Um, you know, moving more and more to an insular direct market approach definitely hurt. I got into comics uh, with the Sonic the Hedgehog comics from Archie uh, in like nineteen ninety three, and I didn't find those in a comic shop. I was with my mom at Kmart, and they had mm. those available. And then after you get into comics, then you go look for a comic shop. People don't tend to go, at least as far as I know, you know, you find comics in other ways and then you go to uh, a direct market kind of shop. Uh, and before me, you know, the decade before in the 80s, uh, there are countless people you talk to who they got into comics because of G.I. Joe, Transformers and things like that. And then they expanded into you know, big two stuff. I was watching, you know, the X-Men cartoon, the Batman animated series, all that stuff in the 90s. I didn't start really regularly reading those comics until I was older, mm -hmm. uh, you know, but I, while I was actively reading, you know, Sock the Hedgehog, some other Archie stuff, I was reading, um, what was it, Nintendo Power at the time? uh was putting out uh they had the super mario world comic that was running through nintendo power that was later collected and like i had stuff like that and, and that got me into the idea of comics and then i i went there from from there but not having you, those comics available other places hurts you mentioned something interesting i remember as, as i was a kid even though i wasn't really a comic book reader there, there just weren't comics sold where i was growing up sure but when you like got a box of cereal every once in a while there might be a spider-man comic in there or when you bought your gi joe action figure sometimes there's a little miniature comic stuck in there or in her yep. e-man or whatever mm -hmm. to kind of promote the characters and provide a backstory to your action yep. figure because they didn't want it to be boring you know if you, you weren't watching the cartoon or whatever and so that was those are like gateway drugs in, into reading comic books full time and i, I don't yeah. like the drug analogy but it works here sure. There really hasn't been that for such a long time. They don't really promote kids' products using miniature comics really anymore. If you go to your your grocery store, there's no comic books in the in the fifty cent aisle, you know, for the impulse buys. If you go to the pharmacy, there's no spinner rack. So a lot of those entryways into comic books have all kind of evaporated over time. Yeah. But kids are still reading comic books, but yeah. they're getting it through like Scholastic because you have you know your book fair. I'm sure you remember that when you were a kid and that's yes. where you get your, your introduction to comics. And it's, you know, it's be manga or uh, some of these young reader lines like Dab Pilkey or Raina Telgemeier. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where they've, they've grabbed their audience. Yeah. Um, also to add to that, 
the first my first real exposure to like image comics was the comics that came with the spawn action figures i was fascinated by the spawn characters uh before i read the comics and then you know you get the action figures you read the comics that came with it um you know played the video games and stuff like that and then go back and and look into that stuff so absolutely that uh you know scholastic same thing uh i I remember that as a kid in like elementary school and uh my mom works at a library and and we'll often talk about how those books uh, i mean going back to captain underpants and on on top of dog man um the rand tegelmeyer stuff all, all that kind of stuff does really well the problem that people i think have is they're conflating dave pilkey and Raina telgemeier with just throwing like a ya book out there is printing money and that's not the case there are plenty that fail but i can tell you i I went, I've had my little, uh, you know, study. I brought, went into a shop with my five-year-old. When he saw the dog band covers, that's the one he picked up because it's it's marketed correctly to a very young uh, reader as far as comic books. You open it up. Sure. Does it have Marvel or DC level artwork? No, but it doesn't need to. It needs to be easy for him to follow. But there's really nothing, just a little bit from DC that I've seen, but really nothing from Marvel out there for for a, a reader at that age, certainly, uh, sure. I imagine once you get to teenagers, it's probably a little bit more accessible. Yeah, I, I'm i not familiar with it, but I know Marvel does these like five minute Marvel hero books or something, these real quick books. And those apparently do really well. I have to look more into them because I really don't know that much about them. I just saw them on Amazon. But, you know, outside of that, uh, in, in terms of like, like, um, you know, DC is, is absolutely the one who's pushing more of those like YA style books and the and primer does really well. And, and the Teen Titans related ones uh, are, are really the ones that sell. Uh, it's weird that the Batman related ones don't seem to move uh, nearly as well as the, the Teen Titan ones until you think for a minute and you go, wait, these are kids who are probably watching Teen Titans Go!, and they were watching that for years and and they like that brand and then when they have a choice to buy something or get their parents to buy something they're going to go with something related to teen titans absolutely so let's talk about dc you know they do have a strategy of marketing to younger readers with these YA graphic novels Mm -hmm. i personally think it's it's a faulty strategy and i'm from what i understand they are running through the stuff that they had already commissioned and paid for, even though that they know that this probably isn't the right track. Well, they have they have a blueprint for success in Primer, mm-hmm. a, a new character aimed at younger readers set within the DC universe. Well, sure, yeah. To speak, but it, it is, that, is, that character is for young readers. It's not supposed to go in the animated stuff. It's not supposed to go into the comic books. Yeah. When they've tried to transfer some of their original characters down, it has not been quite as successful. Do you think that's the path that DC should continue on or do they need to readjust if they want to target and actually acquire these new readers? Yeah. I mean, I think uh, primer is a great example. They should keep pushing that. Um, You know, if I were them, I'd probably be looking into expanding that coming up with a sequel book. Um, If they were thinking of uh, creating a new animated series for, you know, HBO max for kids, that would be, at the top of my list if if I were them and and try to like sort of build on that success uh the the titan stuff like I was saying that that all makes sense because they already whether they were consciously doing it or not they were building that audience there are some characters like you know the super pets and things like that I I think you could do something with uh I think a, a super powered dog with a cape has a lot of appeal uh to kids if you do it right so, so a lot of the pieces are there for them to to move, and they're they're doing something with it. So I think that's that's something. But but yeah, I, I think building on something like Primer, creating more media around it to drive those sales to get the uh, audience more aware of it can only help. I, I'm sure this isn't you know 
for kids, but you know, Invincible, I'm sure those sales are going to keep going through the roof for a while now that they have the cartoon. Um, you know, it, it really worked with Walking Dead for a long time, and Umbrella you know, Academy and yeah, the boys, <laughs> it always has a big effect. Yeah, and that's I, again, I got into the Sonic the Hedgehog comics not because I was looking for comics to read, because I like that property there was more to consume of that property. And, and I got into that that way. Same thing again with G.I. Joe, Transformers and stuff like that. You got kids who realize like there's more story I can be reading, you, you know? So, so creating, you, you want to sell comics for the purpose of, of people buying comics. You want them to be profitable in their own right. But, you know, you leveraging IP to get people into the comics isn't, isn't a bad thing. You know, it's, it's, it's not a bad thing for people to come into comics because they saw a cartoon. I'm fine with that. So getting, getting back to DC, one of the things that they've done with their YA graphic novel line that I think has been faulty is rather than highlighting the, the heroes and introducing them to a new audience, like who is this character, their basics, what's some of their origin story, and basically, basically walk you up you know, in, into being a regular DC reader, it feels like they're highlighting a lot of social issues rather than, than the characters themselves. And maybe the character or aspects of the character end up taking a back or a back seat to actually kind of promoting a, like a, I don't want to say a social agenda, but that seems to be what's more forward as far as the story. There is certainly a market for that. There are young readers who would like to, to read about, uh, you know, a, a young goth, Mm -hmm. you know queer character trying to discover themselves but you know is that really the appropriate place for like a starfire book you know the character or the reader is probably going to go in for starfire and i don't think the crossover of the genres has worked thus far i i still stand by and hope that one day i will be vindicated <laughs> that that book was was a different kind of book that marika tamaki was working on and when they saw the sales of the Teen Titans related books are the ones that are making bank in their YA line, that that book had not been sold yet. And they were just like, just make the mom Starfire and uh, and we'll put it out there. Like, I, I, I still think there's a very good chance that was the case. Um, and I hope we find out one day. But to your broader point, it's... To me, it's less that it's that particular issue, like these are social issues that, that people are talking about, and more that people are, are trying to keep cloning success. So there, there were clearly books in the past that did really well in that format. So now you're just getting clone and clone and clone and clone of that book. You, you know, just like when, you know, Harry Potter came out, we were inundated with, you know, magical kid school books and, and related things. And that's what everyone wanted to to do. Just like when um, Lumberjanes got popular, we suddenly got Gotham Academy. I, I wonder how that happened. You know, that mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. And, you know, some of it's marketing, too, because... Uh, I'll, I'll admit I haven't read every issue of Lumberjanes, but I've probably read more Lumberjanes than most people who are watching this, this particular video. And it's mostly, you know, these girls just going through kind of on these wacky ad adventures and also having these like interpersonal kind of friendships and, and, and where those go. It's, it's not as social agenda driven as, as I think, you know, yeah. people talk about it as, uh, and, and I can't speak for some of these books, but the way they, they market them, you, you know, I know when I was a kid, at least, I, I had no interest in reading like slow burn, slice of life, pseudo romance kind of books. And, and I certainly didn't like uh, too much uh, media that revolved around school. Yeah. Uh, and, and too many of these books uh, seem to revolve around like, oh, we're in middle school or high school and it sucks and people are mean and blah, blah, blah. It's like, I, I, I don't know. I, I feel like when I was a kid, 
when I, I got out of school for the day or the weekend, I didn't want to go back to school. You know, there, there was some media and shows, sure, that that went into that. But a lot of those didn't end up being my favorites. You know, um, I, yeah. I, I don't understand the the appeal and keeping to push that level of it. I think that's a part of it that makes you know, a little sense to me, but, but some of that stuff does sell. So the problem is just because Raina Telgemeier's smile sells really well, doesn't mean 40 clones of that book are going to move. Yeah. So Marvel's a little bit more of an interesting idea. They seem to have like two ideas on how they mm -hmm. want to attack young readers. They have the Marvel action line at IDW, which they do not promote. There are a couple of big names here and there, but you wouldn't know that they are out there if you weren't if I if I didn't have a comic book channel. They they never say anything about them. Sure. And then they also decided to bring in well-known, established YA graphic novel writers and put them on like their regular comic books mm -hmm. that are mostly geared toward the traditional comic audience, which gears a lot older mm -hmm. than these particular writers are used to writing for and they're i guess they're expecting you know 13 to, to 17 year old kids to end up going into a shop to follow that writer onto like a marvel runaways with rainbow or well and i it's just confusing what they're actually trying to do yeah i i mean i some of it i get i'll i'll use the example of moon girl and devil dinosaur yeah. That's a book where uh, Brendan Montclair uh, writes that. I believe he was the editor on All-Star Superman. Like he was a DC editor for a long time, really knows the, the business. He was writing that book. And uh, was it Natasha Book uh, Buscos, I, I think, was illustrating it. It's a gorgeous looking book. The way I think Marvel approached that particular title was we're paying the cost of the team by selling these books. We only have to sell 10,000 copies to cover the costs of the team and putting the book together. Then we're making our profit through Scholastic, through the book market where this book does better. So, so that I kind of understand that Where character translates a lot better because, you know, yeah. she's like eight years old and she's got an enormous dinosaur with her. Yeah. A lot of kids can, can relate to wanting to have a dinosaur. Although sure. I do think it's weird that she's in this Avengers Phoenix <laughs> tournament. Like, yes. Is, we, do we really want to see Wolverine slice apart an eight-year-old for her dinosaur? Yeah. It's like, that's... why are you mixing the, the brands here? <laughs> yeah, it's 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 weird. There, there's a lot of weird brand mixing um you know this outlawed storyline that seems like it will never end uh but but yeah Mar that i think is, is sort of where marvel's coming from in, in those terms that's eventually going to have to change because i, I think that's a downward trajectory and eventually they're going to keep doing that and putting out the floppies isn't going to cover the cost of the teams uh well we don't and, have a yeah a new deal with Penguin Random House, and it would seem yes. like they would have the expertise and the contacts and the knowledge of the market to probably help Marvel, who they have an invested interest in now, to get on the right track. So that's probably good news on that front. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, that's going to be uh, really helpful uh, to see where distribution goes from here, because distribution is a big part of it. You need to get these uh comics and, and these books and other places outside the direct market uh we're also seeing uh on dc's and marvel's uh toyed with this too with Fortnite, but dc is kind of going all in with batman Fortnite with uh yeah. artist riley brown uh who, who's great uh i i really like his work and we're gonna see i mean the the pre-orders on amazon are really high for a book that's not coming out for several months at this point i think it comes out in i think the collected yeah. edition yeah it, it comes well, out the books come out in june i'm not sure about the collected edition. i think the collected editions in september i wasn't so, interested in that until i found out there was a snake eyes batman crossover and i was yeah. like okay now we're talking like two of my favorite characters here yeah that I've, you know they don't really cross over very often yeah so i think if we start seeing more crossover there uh putting a book like that 
where it's going to get views, putting those things at the right websites as well that, um, you know, people are going to that are related to Fortnite. Uh, Feels having... like their new general manager, Daniel Cherry, this was right, right in his wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. I, he, he came from a digital uh, or a video game uh, position before did marketing there and yeah. it feels like is this his first big opportunity to show what he can do at dc kind of feels like it yeah it, it could be and there have been similar uh attempts in the past we've seen uh black mass studios uh briefly tried to uh push this deal they had with hot topic they got comics into hot topic um I, I don't think that ended up uh, panning out as well as, as they hoped, but you know, again, it was an attempt to go into new markets, and that would make something. Yeah, that that made sense. Uh, we know that a few years ago now, um, you know, they were putting some comics in Game Stops, and uh, you know, the the model and the markets changed. Game Stops never been healthier, that. baby. Yeah. Flush with cash. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's all about targeted marketing to, um, you don't want to put the whole catalog everywhere. You know, the direct yeah. market makes sense, you know, okay, fine. We'll put the whole catalog there and let the store owners decide what they want to carry or not. Four to eight key titles. If you're DC or Marvel, you know, Batman, Superman, justice mm -hmm. league, wonder woman, and something else that's hot. You know what I mean? At this time yeah. of Marvel, you'd want, you know, probably Venom out there since it's doing so well. Yeah, but but yeah, if, if you have a place that was like a GameStop or a game store or a website that, that carried games and you were promoting, you know, Batman Fortnite, that would make a lot of sense. If you are a Barnes and Noble and Penguin Random House is getting you comics, you should have, you know, from, I would say at the registers for DC, you should have something Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, Justice League, all up there and for marvel you should have something you know spider-man x-men wolverine avengers at you know the, the register and and move stuff i i think that that could help sort of change how things go from here because because things obviously need to change hence the penguin random house marvel deal that's obviously because they knew if they didn't do something it was going to get worse so, Joe, we, we've kind of talked about targeting very young readers like my son, some teenagers mm -hmm. through different efforts. You know, both publishers have done different things. They've both done the Fortnite crossover. Feels mm -hmm. like DC is going bigger. So you have a crossover with, you know, video game of subculture. Yeah. As a, as a writer, I imagine this is something you think about. Where mm -hmm. is the next generation readers and how are we going to get them? We, we talk about those efforts. What are they not doing that you think would be a good idea? Or, or is there an audience they haven't decided to target yet or go out there and market towards that you think is just waiting to be courted? I think uh, this is a bit more of a, a heady kind of answer, but, but I think they need to take more risks. They need to put some, you know, research and development money aside and take chances. And maybe I'm coming at this from a biased angle as, you, you know, an, an up and comer or someone who has, uh, you know, some credits under his belt, but, uh, you know, isn't like uh, New York Times bestseller or anything like that. But I do think, you know, when, when I was a kid, and, and I think you and everyone else would probably agree, I wasn't sitting back going like, gee, I wish something like Sonic the Hedgehog existed. Someone presented that to me. And then I wanted it. I didn't know I wanted something like that. I, you know, we didn't, you know, when you were a kid, you didn't know you wanted Star Wars before you saw Star Wars. You saw it and then you're like, oh, wow, that was, that's great. I want more. You have to take risks. You know, I don't know I want certain things. None of us do. You know, we the know. The interesting we... thing about this is mm -hmm. you cannot really acquire new readers for free you can get viral marketing and you can get some yeah. attention or whatever maybe that'll give you a, a slight bump but if you want sustained growth you do have to pay for it yeah and it's through targeted marketing and i think that's one of the things that we really haven't seen is marketing outside the current reader base no absolutely and, and there are a, a lot of examples even currently uh whether people like it or not scott pilgrim blew up 
it took three books before it really got noticed, but that's a, you know, million copies sold book at Oni. It's a book that they haven't put anything new out in new material, at least they've done new editions in a decade. But when, even back in 2019, when there were still conventions, if you went to an Oni press booth, it's got Pilgrim all over the place because it's still selling. They they had a, a huge hit and they ran with it. Same thing with, you know, Umbrella Academy. You, you know, that that ended up being a huge hit. It's, it's selling great. Part of that's, again, because of the show right now. Yeah. But that was a big seller. And, and you look at, you know, I mean, Cartoon Network, again, whatever people think about something like Steven Universe, that blew up. That was huge. Kids didn't know they wanted Steven Universe. No one did. It was a new thing. There has to be more of an effort to create something new. And part of the problem that the big two have had lately is even with these movies, they're still mining 80-year-old comics and characters. The most recent successful characters are probably characters like Deadpool and Miles Harley Morales. Quinn, M- Miles Morales. Miles then, Morales is like still going back like a decade. Yeah. But like even then, you know, when you're looking at like Deadpool, Harley Quinn, they're both about 30 years old at this point. Yeah. You know, it's it's a lot of a lot of that kind of stuff. They're gonna Marvel uh to their credit are starting to push the young Avengers in in their live action stuff and um the Kamala Khan Miss Marvel and you know America Chavez and, and these characters to see what happens. And, and and it's necessary because you have to see what's going to hit. And I I think stuff like that and, and taking more risks are, are going to be what creates these new readers. And maybe nine out of 10 or, you know, 19 out of 20 of these attempts fail. It's you just need a, a couple of those to really make it big, to really ride that out for a long time. Look. So, Joe, this will kind of be my my last point, sure. kind, of, kind of question here. You you mentioned something I I needed to bring up. Sure. I think a lot of creators, <clears throat> I think a lot of creators and independent publishers are banking on the need for new IP throughout streaming services. We have mm-hmm. the streaming wars going up. Everyone's got a streaming service. Obviously, Disney Plus is the home of of Marvel. We got HBO Max. It's got all the DC characters, but mm-hmm. you still have you know Netflix. You still have Amazon Prime. You have a lot of other players. It sounds like Apple is trying to be a bigger player. Yep. So there's a need for these IPs in comic book characters and stories are essentially a proven commodity. But it feels like they put all their eggs in the we need to, to make things geared towards a Netflix season or, or a, a series that can be adapted to Amazon. Mm-hmm. And it is successful for the people that get brought on there. And if you're a Mark Millar and you get the Miller World deal, you're going to be very successful, but if you're yeah. IDW and you're co-financing or financing the entire thing for Netflix, mm-hmm. why would they ever promote it? And then it kind of just dies on the vine there. And it feels like everyone's putting their eggs in that streaming money basket rather than taking some chances like you were talking about mm-hmm. and f- thinking outside the box. And what's the next thing that's going to be huge for comic books? Yeah, no, you're 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 onto something. I, I think there are a lot of publishers who, um, you know, are thinking in sort of that way. Uh, you hear stories sometimes about people trying to write a comic in a way that'll be, or, or drawn in a way that'll be more easily adaptable, like a proof uh, of concept almost. Yeah, you know, you, you hear stuff like that. I mean, all these publishers have uh, some sort of agent or uh, liaison to to get these properties to you know, to Netflix or Amazon or, or something like that. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's, it's just people need to like, you should find success wherever you get it, but also you got to put in the effort to do a sell a really good comic because, Mm -hmm. you know, Berserker had Keanu Reeves behind it. Absolutely. But part of why that got picked up is it crushed it on Kickstarter. And then they were able to announce a show after it was the highest selling comic in years. Seven years, yeah. Yeah, that's the kind of PR you want. Not, 
you know, oh, we got a green light or for a pilot maybe from this comic that isn't even out yet from, you know, someone. It's, it's like, it's it's not, that that's not what's going to be successful in the in the future and, and going forward it's it's a it's a nice some people are going to be successful but it's not mm-hmm. an, an end-all be-all for every creator and every you know ip that's out there no and and uh, going back to the scott pilgrim example that book sold gangs gangbusters still sells gangbusters that movie did not do well so you you know you don't know what what's going to happen. You you might not have that big, you know, success uh, just because the the movie does well or or the comic does well. So, yep. So the the comic book industry in general does find do find themselves in, in a bit of a conundrum. Marvel seems like they've done something. They made a move. We'll see what comes out of the Penguin Random House deal. DC Comics seems to have had a more uh, thorough strategy moving forward. Although I think it's they're going to have to adapt it a bit, but mm-hmm. new readers have to come some come from somewhere that you know. Otherwise, the, the industry, the Western comics industry, will will just keep dwindling. So it's an important yeah. topic, Joe. I really appreciate you coming on here and talking about it. No Is there one last thing you wanted to say before we wrap this up? Uh, we may see uh, an influx in readers in the future as uh, the price of tablets uh, continue to go down. Um, yes. If they can create tablets, uh, especially if you could create a tablet that's basically the size of a hardcover and oversized hardcover that actually opens up and gives you that kind of experience of opening a double page spread and you can get those prices down, I, I think there's a bigger future in uh, digital down the line. It'll be easier for people to to hop aboard and that's something that would have seemed implausible a decade ago and now seems like it's only a matter of time so we'll see couldn't agree with you more thank you so much joe thank you